Welcome back to True Crime Case Files. Today, we travel to the quiet town of Torrington, Connecticut in January of 1982, where a brutal murder shattered the sense of security in this small community. The victim, Daisy Winnows, was a beloved 67-year-old local figure, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a family fractured by estrangement. Daisy Winnows was a pillar of the Torrington community, known for her vibrant personality and infectious smile. Widowed after the passing of her beloved husband, Carl, the previous year, Daisy channeled her energy into running a popular flower shop, aptly named Petals and Blooms. Prior to her entrepreneurial venture, she had dedicated years of her life to shaping young minds as a beloved kindergarten teacher at Torrington Elementary School. Despite her professional success, Daisy's personal life was marked by estrangement from her adult children, who resided in different states. The specifics of their fractured relationship remained a mystery to town residents, but Daisy held on to a glimmer of hope that one day they would reconcile. She yearned to witness the formation of their future families, an aspiration that fueled her every waking moment. In January of 1982, as the harsh winter gripped Torrington, Daisy's life was abruptly cut short. The news of her murder would send shockwaves through the tight-knit community, where such heinous acts were unheard of. Residents who once felt safe walking the streets at night now clutched their loved ones a little tighter, haunted by the chilling realization that evil could lurk in their midst. It was a frigid morning on January 12, 1982, in Torrington, Connecticut. The temperature had dropped to minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit overnight, and the town was covered in snow. Most residents were still indoors, trying to stay warm and catch up on the news. But for one young man, the day would be marked by a horrific discovery that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Wally Nathaniel, a 17-year-old high school senior, had a part-time job as a delivery boy for the local newspaper, The Register Citizen. He had been working for the paper since he was 14 and knew the town and its people well. One of his favorite stops was Petals and Blooms, a quaint shop run by Daisy Winnows, a 67-year-old widow and former kindergarten teacher. Wally admired Daisy for her cheerful demeanor and kindness and often chatted with her when he dropped off her paper. That morning, Wally arrived at Daisy's Flowers around 9.35 a.m. as usual. He noticed that the shop's door was slightly ajar, which was unusual for Daisy and unusual given the cold weather. Wally knocked on the door, but there was no answer. He pushed the door open and stepped inside, calling out Daisy's name. What he saw next made him scream and drop his papers. Daisy was lying on the floor behind the counter, surrounded by a pool of blood. Her arms were almost cut off, and her face was unrecognizable. She had been brutally murdered, apparently with a large knife or a matchet. Wally ran out of the shop, terrified, and called the police from a nearby payphone. The murder of Daisy Winnows would become a mystery that baffled authorities. Who would kill a harmless old lady in such a barbaric way? What was the motive behind this senseless crime? And where was the killer? These questions remained unanswered for months until a surprising twist in the case revealed the shocking truth behind Daisy's death. As soon as Wally Nathaniel reported his grisly discovery, the Torrington Police Department sprang into action. Within minutes, several patrol cars and an ambulance arrived at Petals and Blooms, followed by a forensic team and two homicide detectives. The shop was quickly sealed off with yellow tape, and curious bystanders were kept at a distance. The detectives in charge of the case were Michael Harrison and Sarah Jones-Levy, both seasoned veterans with impressive track records. They had worked together for over five years and had solved some of the most challenging cases in the state. They were known for their thoroughness, professionalism, and dedication. But even they were not prepared for the horror that awaited them inside the shop. As they entered, they were greeted by a scene of carnage that made them gasp. Daisy Winnows, the victim, was lying on the floor behind the counter, her body mutilated beyond recognition. Her arms were almost severed from her torso, and her face was slashed beyond repair. She had suffered multiple stab wounds to her chest, abdomen, and neck. Blood was everywhere, staining the floor, the walls, and the flowers. The detectives quickly surveyed the scene, looking for clues. They noticed that the shop was in a state of disarray, as if a struggle had taken place. Flower pots were broken, 
vases were smashed, and petals were scattered. A trail of bloody footprints led from the counter to the back door, indicating that the killer had fled that way. The back door was unlocked, and there were no signs of forced entry. The detectives also spotted the murder weapon, a large cleaver lying on a table near the door. It was covered in blood and fingerprints. The detectives wondered how the killer had obtained such a weapon, and why he had left it behind. They proceeded to collect evidence, taking photos, measurements, and samples. They also interviewed Wally Nathaniel, the delivery boy who had found the body. He was still shaken by the ordeal and could not provide much information. He said he had arrived at the shop around 9.35 a.m. and had found the door slightly open. He had entered calling out Daisy's name and had seen her body. He had run out screaming and had called the police from a nearby payphone. He said he had not seen anyone else around the shop and that he had no idea who would want to kill Daisy. The detectives thanked him for his cooperation and told him they would be in touch. They then contacted the coroner, who arrived shortly after. He examined the body and confirmed that Daisy had died from blood loss due to the multiple stab wounds. He estimated that the time of death was between 9 o'clock and 9.30 a.m., based on the body temperature and rigor mortis. He also noted that Daisy had defensive wounds on her hands, suggesting that she had tried to fight off her attacker. The detectives were puzzled by the motive behind the murder. Daisy Winnows was a well-liked and respected member of the community, with no known enemies or problems. The detectives decided to look into Daisy's personal life, hoping to find some clues. They also hoped to find some witnesses who might have seen or heard something suspicious around the shop that morning. They knew they had a tough case ahead of them, and that time was of the essence. They had to catch the killer before he struck again. The first person that Detectives Harrison and Jones Levy wanted to talk to was Nick Hasselby, Daisy's boyfriend. Nick was a 41-year-old plumber who had met Daisy six months ago, when he had fixed a leak in her shop. They had hit it off and had started dating soon after. Nick was a handsome and charming man who had a reputation for being a ladies' man. He had been married twice before and had several girlfriends in between. He was also 26 years younger than Daisy, which raised some eyebrows in the town. The detectives wondered if Nick had any motive to kill Daisy. Could he have been after her money or her shop? Could he have been jealous of her relationship with her children or someone else? Could he have been involved in some shady business or had a secret enemy? They decided to find out. They tracked down Nick at his apartment, where he lived alone. They knocked on the door and Nick opened it. He looked surprised to see them and asked them what they wanted. They told him they were investigating Daisy's murder and asked him if he could come with them to the station for some questions. Nick agreed and followed them to their car. At the station, they took Nick to an interrogation room where they asked him about his relationship with Daisy. Nick said he loved Daisy and that they were very happy together. He said he had no idea who would want to kill her or why. He said he had nothing to do with her death and that he was heartbroken by the news. He said he had last seen her the night before, when they had dinner at a local Italian restaurant, and then went back to her place. He said he had left around 11 o'clock p.m., and had gone straight home. He said he had an alibi, his neighbor, who had seen him arrive and leave his apartment. The detectives asked him if he had any problems with Daisy, or anyone else. Nick said he had not, and that he got along well with everyone. He said he had no enemies, no debts, no secrets. He said he had a good job and a good life. He said he had nothing to hide. The detectives were not convinced. They pressed him harder, trying to find any inconsistencies or contradictions in his story. They asked him about his past marriages, his previous girlfriends, his financial situation, his hobbies, his friends. They asked him if he had ever been violent or had a criminal record. They asked him if he had ever cheated on Daisy or had any other lovers. They asked him if he had ever argued with Daisy or had any disagreements. They asked him if he knew anyone who might have a grudge against him or Daisy. Nick denied everything. He said he was faithful, honest, and peaceful. He said he had never hurt anyone or done anything wrong. He said he had no enemies, no rivals, no conflicts. He said he only loved Daisy and wanted to be with her. He said he was innocent and begged them to believe him. The detectives were not sure what to think. 
Nick seemed sincere, but also suspicious. His story was consistent, but also convenient. His alibi was solid, but also shaky. His motive was unclear, but also possible. They decided to keep him under surveillance and to check his background. They also decided to look for other suspects, who might have a stronger connection to the crime. While Nick Hasselby remained a prime suspect, the detectives did not rule out other possibilities. They decided to look into the last person who had seen Daisy alive, according to the shop's records. That person was Danny Waters, a 24-year-old man who had bought a bouquet of roses from Daisy at 9.15 a.m., just 20 minutes before her body was found. Danny Waters was an odd and lonely figure in the town. He lived with his mother, Carla, who ran a car wash on the outskirts of Torrington. He had no job, no friends, no hobbies. He rarely left his house, except to run errands for his mother or to visit Daisy's shop. He was also illiterate, having never attended school or learned to read or write. The detectives were curious about Danny's relationship with Daisy. Why did he buy roses from her that morning? Who were they for? What did they talk about? Did he notice anything unusual or suspicious? They decided to pay him a visit. They drove to the car wash where they found Carla Waters working. She was a 49-year-old woman with a stern and weary face. She greeted them coldly and asked them what they wanted. They told her they were investigating Daisy's murder and that they wanted to talk to Danny. Carla said Danny was not home and that he had nothing to do with Daisy's death. She said Danny was a good boy who never hurt anyone. She said Daisy was a nice lady who was kind to Danny. She said they had no reason to kill her. The detectives asked Carla if they could search her house, and she reluctantly agreed. They followed her to a small and shabby house, next to the car wash. They entered and were struck by the smell of dirt and decay. They searched the house, looking for any clues or evidence. They found nothing of interest except for a cardboard box in the attic, where Danny slept. Inside the box, they found a pile of books, magazines, and newspapers. They were puzzled by this, since Danny was illiterate. They asked Carla about it, and she said Danny liked to look at the pictures and that he collected them as a hobby. The detectives were not satisfied with this explanation. They took some of the books and magazines with them and left. They took them to the station, where they examined them more closely. They were shocked by what they found. The books and magazines were all about flowers, gardening, and nature. They were all marked with notes written in a childish and clumsy handwriting. The notes were simple words such as rose, sun, love. The detectives realized that these were not just pictures, but lessons. Someone had been teaching Danny to read. They wondered who that someone was, and they had a hunch. They checked the dates and titles of the books and magazines, and compared them with Daisy's shop's records. They found a match. Every time Danny had bought flowers from Daisy, he had also received a book or a magazine from her. The detectives had discovered a surprising connection. Daisy, moved by Danny's illiteracy, had been secretly tutoring him in her spare time. She had been giving him books and magazines, along with notes and instructions, to help him learn to read. She had been doing this for months without anyone's knowledge. The detectives were amazed by this revelation. They wondered what Daisy's motive was and what Danny's feelings were. They wondered if this was a platonic or a romantic relationship and how Carla felt about it. They wondered if this had anything to do with Daisy's murder. They decided to talk to Danny again and to find out more. The case seemed to hit a dead end as the detectives ran out of leads and suspects. Nick Hasselby and Danny Waters had solid alibis and no other person had a clear motive or opportunity to kill Daisy. The detectives were frustrated and desperate, as the media and the public demanded answers. Then, a ray of hope. A forensic technician, working on the fingerprint analysis, found a match. A single print, left on the cleaver that was used as the murder weapon, belonged to none other than Carla Waters, Danny's mother. The detectives were stunned by this discovery. Carla Waters had not been on their radar as she had no apparent connection to Daisy, except for being Danny's mother. She had also cooperated with the police and had allowed them to search her house. She had seemed indifferent rather than suspicious. The detectives wondered what Carla's motive was and how and why she had pulled off the crime. They decided to confront her and to get some answers. 
The fingerprint match was a game changer for the detectives. They had a new suspect and a new lead. They decided to dig deeper into Carla Waters' background and to find out what she was hiding. Carla Waters was a 49-year-old woman who had lived in Torrington all her life. She had never married and had raised a Danny on her own. She ran a car wash on the edge of town, which she had inherited from her father. She was a quiet and reserved person who kept to herself and rarely socialized. She was also fiercely protective of Danny, whom she considered her only reason for living. The detectives also learned that Carla had a troubled past, marked by trauma and abuse. She had become pregnant with Danny at 15. She had never told anyone about it, and had given birth to Danny in secret. Carla had developed a twisted form of maternal obsession, bordering on abuse. She had isolated Danny from the world, and had denied him any education, socialization, or normalcy. She had forced him to eat only raw barley, like a horse, and had made him sleep naked in a cardboard box in the attic. She had controlled every aspect of his life, and had convinced him that she was the only person who loved him and cared for him. The detectives also learned that Carla had a paranoid and delusional personality, fueled by her guilt and fear. She had believed that Danny and Daisy were having sex, and that they were plotting to kill her. She had spied on them, and had seen them exchanging books and notes. She had misinterpreted their innocent gestures as signs of betrayal and conspiracy. She had become consumed by an irrational jealousy, and had decided to take matters into her own hands. The detectives had enough evidence to arrest Carla, and to confront her with the truth. They went to her house, where they found her sitting on the couch, watching a replay of Donahue. She looked calm and composed, as if nothing had happened. She greeted them politely, and asked them what they wanted. They told her they had a warrant for her arrest, and that they knew she had killed Daisy. They showed her the fingerprint match, and the books and notes they had found in Danny's box. Carla's demeanor changed instantly. She became agitated and defensive, and denied everything. She said they had no proof, and that they were lying. She said she had nothing to do with Daisy's death, and that she loved Danny more than anything. She said Danny and Daisy were the ones who had killed her, and that they were trying to frame her. She said they were evil, and that she deserved to die. The detectives were shocked by Carla's reaction. They realized that she was mentally unstable, and that she had no remorse or regret. They handcuffed her and took her to their car. They also called Danny and told him what had happened. Danny was speechless and could not believe that his mother was the killer. He said he was sorry for Daisy and that he had no idea what his mother had done. The detectives had solved the case, but they had also uncovered a dark and tragic story. A story of a mother's love gone wrong, and a son's life ruined. A story of a woman's madness, and a town's horror. A story of a flower's beauty, and a murder's brutality. The trial of Carla Waters began on March 15, 1982, at the Litchfield County Courthouse. The judge presiding over the case was William Balls, a respected and experienced jurist. The prosecutor was Emily Carter, a young and ambitious assistant district attorney. The defense attorney was Thomas Hines, a seasoned and skillful public defender. The prosecution's case was built on the fingerprint evidence, the books and notes found in Danny's box, and the testimony of Danny and the detectives. Emily Carter portrayed Carla as a cold-blooded and calculating killer, who had planned and executed the murder of Daisy Winnows out of a twisted sense of control over her son. She argued that Carla had acted with premeditation and malice, and that she deserved the maximum penalty, life imprisonment without parole. The defense's case was based on Carla's mental state, her abusive past, and her lack of criminal record. Thomas Hines argued that Carla was a mentally ill and traumatized woman who had suffered from a psychotic break and had acted under the influence of a delusion. He pleaded for the jury's mercy and compassion, and asked them to consider a lesser charge, manslaughter. The trial lasted for two weeks, and was filled with dramatic and emotional moments. Daisy's friends and colleagues testified about her kindness and generosity, and expressed to their grief and outrage. Danny testified about his mother's abuse and his relationship with Daisy, and broke down in tears. Carla testified in her own defense, and maintained her innocence and her delusion, and showed no remorse or empathy. The jury, composed of six men and six women, 
deliberated for three days. They reviewed the evidence, the testimonies, and the arguments. They weighed the facts, the emotions, and the law. They debated, argued, and voted. Finally, they reached a unanimous verdict. Guilty of first-degree murder. The verdict was announced on March 29, 1982, at 4.15 p.m. The courtroom was silent as the jury foreman read the verdict. Then a wave of reactions swept the room. Some gasped, some sobbed, some cheered. Carla Waters showed no reaction and remained expressionless. Judge Balls thanked the jury for their service and pronounced the sentence, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He ordered Carla to be taken away and adjourned the court. For Daisy's family, the verdict was a bittersweet closure. They finally learned the truth about their mother's final days and saw justice done. But they also felt the pain of their estrangement and the loss of their chance to reconcile. They hogged each other and vowed to stay in touch. The trial of Carla Waters was over, but the aftermath of her crime was not. The lives of those affected by her actions were forever changed, and they had to find a way to move on. Danny Waters, the son of the killer and the friend of the victim, faced the most challenges. He had been freed from his mother's tyranny, but he had also lost the only person who had shown him kindness and compassion. He had to deal with the trauma of his past and the uncertainty of his future. He had to learn to read, to work, to live. He did not have to do it alone, though. He received extensive therapy and support from the community who rallied around him and offered him help and hope. He also received a generous donation from Daisy's family, who forgave him and wished him well. He eventually found a job at a local bookstore, where he developed a passion for reading and learning. He also found love and married a young woman who accepted him for who he was. He had a son, whom he named Carl, after Daisy's late husband. He never forgot Daisy and kept a picture of her in his wallet. He visited her grave every year and thanked her for changing his life. Detectives Harrison and Jones Levy, the heroes of the case, also faced some challenges. They had witnessed one of the most tragic and twisted stories of human nature. They had seen the best and the worst of humanity, and they had been affected by it. They continued their careers, but they also sought counseling and support. They vowed to bring justice to victims and closure to their families, but they also learned to cope with their own emotions and stress. They remained partners and became friends. The town of Torrington, the scene of the crime, also faced some challenges. It had been shaken by the events of that winter and had lost some of its innocence and security. It had to deal with the stigma and the sorrow, and to rebuild its reputation and its spirit. It did not have to do it alone, though. It received support and sympathy from neighboring towns and cities, who offered their condolences and assistance. It also received recognition and praise from the state and the nation, who applauded its resilience and courage. It gradually healed and regained its peace and harmony. Daisy's Flower Shop, now owned by a young couple who had admired her work, remained a landmark, a silent reminder of the vibrant life cut short and the enduring complexities of the human condition. The case of Daisy Winnows serves as a chilling reminder that appearances can be deceiving and the darkness within the human heart can manifest in unexpected forms. It is a story of love, loss, twisted obsession, and the lengths some are willing to go to in the name of a warped perception of control. It is a story that leaves a lasting impact, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of tragedy and the enduring search for truth and justice. Hey, true crime case solvers, interested in more real-life murder mysteries? Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. And do you have any thoughts about this case or have a case of your own you'd like us to investigate? Leave us a comment. Until then, stay safe, true crime case solvers.